Okay. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back, those of you who were with us in session one. This is uh, session two, titled What's Next for Wine and Culinary Tourism? And we're delighted to have two of our IYTC keynote speakers with us um, that will be uh, speaking at the, the event in October uh, this year. And uh, they've come, well, we've actually invited them to come along to share their, their wisdom on the future for wine and culinary tourism in the new normal. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce, um, uh, let's just bring, the, bring them all up. First, I'd like to uh, introduce um, Peter Sim. Hi, Peter. Hi there. Hi, folks. Pete, I'll just tell a little bit about Peter. Uh, quick, Peter operates his own inbound adventure activity business in, in Scotland and also an outbound global expedition business. He has also owned and operated inbound activity business in Spain and Morocco. He's traveled and operated in over 120 countries, and his businesses have helped introduce over 200,000 customers for, to adventure. He's a regular speaker at travel events around the world and will be at ours in uh, 2020 uh, on the impact of the digital area, digital era, sorry, on small tourism businesses, which after all, that's most of us, and what they can do to thrive with so much change uh, happening, especially now. He's also a regular speaker at the University uh, MBA and executive leadership courses on digital transformation. His current passion is being a strategic advisor to several scalable digital startups in the tours and activities se sector. Recently, I've uh, been on a, a wine tasting tour in Georgia, uh, so he's uh, not a novice to the industry, uh, this kind of tourism. So Peter will be delivering a talk on at iWine TC 2020 titled Growing Your Wine Tourism Bookings Using OT OTAs and Digital Distribution. So a lot of you have been asking uh, uh, for talk on this subject, how to um, use OTAs and digital distribution. So this is uh, some a session you uh, shouldn't miss. So over to Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi there. Hello. Hi, everyone. Also in Bonnie, Scotland, I believe. Yes, yes. <laughs> So Chris is uh, an author and brand digital tourism expert with over 26 uh, years in the industry, knowledge, and speaks at many tourism events worldwide, like says Pete. In fact, they're often at the same events talking. Uh, he offers advice and guidance on how travel tourism and destination businesses can gain brand recognition and increase bookings. So that's interesting for all of us, I think. Chris is the author of the uh, book, How to Turn Your Online Lookers into Bookers, a 400-page book full of practical marketing advice dedicated to the tours and activities sector. So that's right up uh, the wine tourism street. Uh, Chris also produces a video uh, uh, advice series, uh, The Digital Tourism Show, um, which I, I've watched a few and they're very interesting. Uh, so you can watch on his Facebook group, YouTube channel, or listen on Google and Apple podcasts. And Chris will be delivering a talk at IYNTC 2020 titled How to Easily Generate 90 Days of Content to Promote Your Tour Businesses, which is content being key to um, attracting uh, consumers, uh, wine tourists in our case, food tourism. So we're going to begin with Chris, uh, who's going to share his wisdom on the topics of, so what's next for wine and culinary tourism? And of course, feel free to ask any questions uh, on the chat there. Um, of course, do say hello, uh, where you're from. And uh, if you have any questions, just um, mark the circle the, in red so that we can see that it's a question. We'll uh, do our very best to answer all of your questions, and if we can't, uh, those we can't, we'll make a blog post uh, with the answers to the questions we couldn't answer, so you can uh, read the answers uh, after the uh, program. So, over to Chris. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for thanks for letting me join you and giving you some of my thoughts uh, and wisdom in terms of how I feel uh, your industry is going to push forward. Um, I have a couple of slides to show you, but in terms of uh, more as a visual cue, but my, my initial thoughts about how um, the sort of wine tourism and food tourism in general will push forward is, is actually quite a strong one in my opinion. You know, one of the good aspects about what 
most operators do in this sector um, is, is what a lot of people want to do and a lot of customers want to do uh, and will want to do when they come out of, of lockdown and out of restrictions because you know, one of the best forms of tours in terms of food tourism or wine tourism is it brings people together and that is what your customers are, are screaming out for as soon as things are restricted you know here in the uk where we're based um, as soon as it was announced where certain countries that we could fly to bookings increased for flights and accommodation and other aspects as well and like i say food tourism is certainly going to be um one of those aspects which brings people together no family friends all wanting to get together they've not seen each other for so long um and it's the sector that you guys are in is going to be in my opinion one of the strongest sectors out there and um, but that's not to say that you can't you have to you can sit back and wait for all these bookings and, and leads to come in that's not what's going to happen you do have to go out there and let people know that you exist and um, that you are here ready for business uh, and to attract um your demographics and your markets and um, i understand that will be changed for a lot of different different operators going forward whether that's your you cater more for domestic or more for international obviously a lot of you will have to pivot your business um, and one of the best ways of targeting various key demographics in my opinion is through facebook i know peter has his own uh, uh, thoughts on facebook um, has had a lot of good, good success with that as well uh, but for me facebook is hands down one of the best most targeted platforms out there and still one of the cheapest platforms in terms of paid advertising um so hopefully i'm going to share uh, a little couple of slides with you um hopefully you can see that on the screen shortly there we go so um, in terms of of facebook and hitting your demographic you no know, when you think of what's been happening over the last three or four months you no know, people have obviously been self-isolating and they've literally had nothing to do but watch tv watch netflix or surf the web um, no, there's only so much conversation you can have with your family about the same four walls you've been staring at for the last four months. So people are surfing the web more. People are looking for more things that they wish they could be doing or want to do when they come out of lockdown. Um, so hopefully throughout this time, um, you guys have not been, uh, have not stopped any marketing. No, if anything, you should be putting out videos and written content, which you can put out for free. You can film things on your your iphones and mobile mobile devices and getting that content out there for free um, and putting it out there during your time in lockdown and this will help inspire uh, any of your new customers or any customers wanting to do your type of activity or just wanting to find inspiration for things to do when we do come out of lockdown um, and this is what i'm going to give you now um, uh, is give you some key demographics which i feel are going to be strong going forward which may be beneficial for your business because like i say though people are just wanting to get back together with their family and friends food and drink uh, is one of the best aspects uh, to bring people together um, well we all love getting together with a family we all love having a bite to eat whether that's a barbecue or going to a winery or having a glass of wine or something like that people love this type of aspect um, and you guys are in a prime position for for people to come back together so let me talk about a few of the facebook demographics now i know i've only got 10 minutes for the chat so i'll be as quickly as i can so one uh, so again key, key demographics for marketing on facebook that i would be i would consider that you guys look out for your own demographics um obviously a big one going forward uh, is going to be small groups i think we are far from the days of being able to target large groups um so everything has to be small groups make sure you're getting across the wording that you're following the, the right guidelines for safety for whether you're wearing masks whether you're doing hygiene all these other things that people will be looking for and expecting post covid so make sure that a lot of the products that you have um, are going to be aimed at small groups and we're actually seeing a lot of businesses shift from group tours to actually self guided or self group tours and things like that as well so maybe that's i don't know how you can do that within a winery but that's maybe another aspect to sort of see can you do a self-guided tour within the within the constraints of your product type that could be another thing and we're actually seeing a rise in self-guided products as well uh, and actually there's been some backing from some other businesses into uh, other platforms to push self-guided as well so this is going to be a big one going forward but so small groups are self-guided one of the other aspects that we find is, is becoming bigger um, uh, from our own research and from our own customers that, we're, uh, that we're, we, we deal with is the over 60s market. Um, now, a lot of 
the over 60s who may not have uh, had Facebook accounts before, who were not online as readily uh, as before, because of lockdown, have had to be, they've had to create Facebook accounts. They've been doing lots more Zoom meetings, for example. You know, if I, if I thought of my mother, my own mother, who is over 60, you know, four months ago, being on WhatsApp and doing video calls and everything, we would have just laughed. But she's doing it. She's created a Facebook account to stay in touch with family and friends. We have family in Portugal as well. So we're staying in touch with them and we tend to find some of the older generation, um, if I can call them that, um, as, or mature generation, I should say, is creating more Facebook accounts uh, and staying online. So again, this is going to become a bigger market to target going forward because there are more of them online and more of them on Facebook. So that's maybe one demographic to look at. Another one which may not be suitable for all businesses, but is students. No, when you actually think about what's been happening, um, if anything, students um, are known. Uh, I don't like to tarnish the same brush with everyone, um, but students are known for liking to have a drink and going out clubbing and going to cafes and all these other things as well. But they've not been able to do that. So for probably for the first time in their lives, they've been saving money. So uh, they'll have that money to burn uh, once the lockdowns are restricted. So they will want to get back with family and friends. No, they have not been able to celebrate, or even if they're just joining a university or joining a college, they've not been able to celebrate that properly. So they want to get out with family, friends, and that could be another potential market sort of for the food and drink industry and, and wineries as a whole. So that's maybe one to obviously target on Facebook, which you can target these specifics again for those who are not familiar on Facebook. Another big one, I would say, is a corporate and business market. So if you think about all the employees uh, and employers who have been stuck at home or working from home uh, in some cases, building up those bonds between their employees, bringing people back together and um, going out on a team building exercise. Um, I know Peter has uh, have a lot of that as well with the type of tours that he runs, but within sort of wine tourism and food tourism in general, again, bringing those people back together, bringing those businesses together, those employees together uh, to just we create those, we connect those bonds between the employers and employees. So corporate and business is going to be, in my opinion, one of the big markets to look at going forward. And again, you can target those specific markets on Facebook by business size, by how much money they make and all the other types of things you can target on Facebook. There's so many things you can target with businesses on Facebook and even specific business niche markets and et cetera as well. So if you are happen to be in... Um, uh, an area uh, that is big for tech, for example, you can target IT companies, tech companies, and bring them along to your winery or food tour uh, and do that type of thing as well. So the Facebook, again, being super specific on your marketing um, with corporate and team building opportunities will be one of the ones going forward that I rec recommend. And milestones, um, people who have celebrated a birthday, an anniversary, birth of a child, whatever that would be, um, a lot of that has happened during lockdown. That has not stopped. You no, know, you can target people with upcoming birthdays, but also with birthdays and anniversaries that have happened in the past months. So those people who have only been able to celebrate properly on a Zoom chat um, with family and friends, they can then, why don't you target that demographic and say, hey, you didn't celebrate properly. Why don't you come out with us, have a drink, have some food, enjoy yourself with your family and celebrate in the right and proper manner. That would be another one you could target on Facebook. Um, and again, with the whole idea of bringing people together through food and drink, to me, this is one of the sort of, I hate to use the term low-hanging fruit, but this is one of the sort of low-hanging fruit targets that I would say that every business should be targeting, um, especially those who can help celebrate these type of milestones. So milestones is certainly going to be one going forward that I would also recommend that you look at on Facebook. And finally, well, frontline staff. Well, we uh, these can, These guys, doctors, nurses, veterans you know, in some areas, you know, all these people who have been working um, throughout the whole COVID crisis and have been putting their lives at risk to, to possibly catch this virus, they have been trying to keep the world ticking over. You can target those specific people on Facebook. Um, I'm not one big, huge one for offering discounts and discounting. I think that can cheapen a product, but this is maybe one aspect and one demographic. You could offer some sort of offer to them to, as a way to say thank you for all your hard work and um, thank you to all the doctors and nurses etc by giving them some sort of discount and bringing them across to your wineries and your food tour businesses to enjoy themselves and get away from the madness that has happened over the last four weeks uh, and letting them enjoy themselves and again you can target them specifically on facebook 
So there is other demographics. My time is short here, and I'm sure we'll be getting questions uh, coming up as well. But these were just some of the key demographics I feel which you'll be able to target for your wineries and your food tour businesses and drink businesses on Facebook uh, going forward. And again, as I said at the start, I feel um, for for your type of sector, I feel the future uh, is bright personally because people will just want to uh, go out, explore, see your scenery, but also do that by, while enjoying food and drink because it does bring people together. So hopefully those little tips helped and obviously we can, I can help answer any other questions that come up during this webinar. Okay, great. Uh, in fact, we had uh, on, on the program uh, earlier that um, uh, from Frulia Venezia Giulia that vineyards were in fact um, uh, clearly one of the safest uh, places to, to be in. The, 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 just the vineyards alone are huge expanses. That's why we have the the picture of the um, the mm -hmm. vineyards with the tree, just to show how, how how much open space there is. And of course, wineries tend to be. Uh, 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 sizable as well. In fact, uh, most interesting is 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 out in the vineyard. So, um, wine tourism will flourish for sure. I think. I believe so. Okay. So, um, um, same question for Peter. Then, um, what's what's next for wine and culinary tourism, and from from your uh, in your eyes? Hi, folks. Uh, good to meet you. I'm speaking to you here from Scotland, uh, where we don't do much wine tourism, but we do an awful lot of whiskey tourism. And in fact, from where I'm sitting at the moment, I'm literally 150 metres away from Dewar's Distillery that does about 40 to 50,000 guests a year on drink tourism that we work uh, hand with with the adventure products and drink tourism. What I'm going to speak to you today about is more the operational side. Chris has covered a lot of the, the potential market and business side. This is more the operational side. And I spend a lot of my time as a consultant with various companies around the world, tour operators and technology companies that serve them. But what I'm speaking to you today about is real live operational concerns and difficulties that I am personally experiencing myself today and yesterday because we opened for the first time after uh, COVID on Saturday. So my own operations are, are learning as we go. And I'm just going to cover off over some of the challenges I see as we open up to the tourism that is available this year. I'm going to start with some positives because I do believe there is huge positives. It may not be all realized this year, but certainly next year and onwards, there's going to be some huge positives for your sector of wine and tourism. So I'm going to cover them all first, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the operational challenges that are hopefully just challenges for the next X number of months until we get into a, a better position in the world with a COVID-free world at some time in the future. So if we start with the positives, the tours and activities pre-COVID sector, which includes wine and food tourism, was annually grossing $254 billion. I'll repeat that. $254 billion. It was the fastest growing sector in tourism. Now, the better news for you guys is within that $254 uh, billion, the fastest growing sector within that was food and drink tourism. So you're in the fastest growing sector in travel, and then your niche within that fastest growing sector was the fastest growing. So you can't ask to be in a better place pre-COVID. So all of that is great news, and these figures are not mine. They come from our research organization called Arrival. Uh, it's kind of have done a lot of work over this period to come up with, the, with these figures. So these are genuine research figures. So great news. Massive market, fastest growing market in tourism, and food and drink is the fastest niche within that. Also, just from watching the development over the last three, four years, if I'm looking at all the innovation of product, within tours and activities, and I get to see every single sector, I would say I've seen vastly more innovation within food and drink than any other sector. They're out innovating the rest of the sectors with the new tours are coming up, the new experiences, the new places, the new types of food, the new types of drink, all of it combined. It's The innovation has been impressing me because it's not really my sector, uh, but I've been impressed watching from afar with the innovation. To the extent it's in it's impressed on me enough that I've got bone operators, operations now getting more involved with food and drink tourism. Uh, not for we want to be a food and drink tourism operator, but we're partnering now with lots of food and drink tourism operators to create packaged products. So I do a lot of adventure stuff, 
But I know everyone needs to eat and drink every day. Now, obviously, the things we do, we can't be involved in alcoholic drinks pre uh, the adventures, but certainly post adventures, we are doing a lot more food and drink tourism, combining it to make it a more rounded experience for the client, and the client gets a better experience. And we're using partners to do that. So I would suggest in whatever region of the world you are, whatever wine region of the world you are, you're going to have other companies around there that are doing different services that you may want to look at that you can partner with because we have certainly had huge success by doing that, all of this pre-COVID, uh, obviously. Some of the other uh, advantages and positives I'm seeing, and they may not strike you as advantages as, at the moment, but going forward, they will be. The adoption of digital products and digital services and digital technology which was fast growing anyway by tour companies. All tour companies were eventually getting themselves into the digital world by using reservation systems, using distribution systems, uh, using more digital means to communicate with the customer. All of that over COVID has speeded up by a factor I don't know what. It's just crazy how fast the innovation in technology and the adoption of technology I've seen by tour companies happen over the last three months. And I know it was forced rather than necessarily wanted, but it was a good thing because they were going to have to adopt a lot of this technology anyway. So when you're closed and when you couldn't guarantee uh, generate any revenue, it was the best time to actually start uh, adopting some more technology into your business and testing it because the customer, we are all customer led, doesn't matter what sector you're in, we're all customer led. And I watch customers like a hawk and they just spend their time on mobile phones and technology and we need to align our businesses with that. So the adoption of the digital world, I see as an advantage. That combined with the fact that you're in the fastest growing sector, if you look forward to 2020, 2021, sorry, you're in a good position if we can get over this COVID thing. Now I just want to talk about some of the challenges for this particular period, because obviously many of you have opened up, some of you won't have opened up yet, and some of you will be trying to open up going forward. And some of you have, speaking from Australia, you may have opened up and then been closed down again. Maybe some of USA operators had opened up and been closed down again. And that is an incredibly challenging thing to do. And I'm just going to speak from my own experience of opening up over the last few weeks. The first thing was planning. We had to make a judgment on when do you open up, obviously taking into consideration all the different regulations from all the different governments, wherever you are. But you then have to make a judgment on when do you start marketing? When do you start going from inspiration for the future to the clients to paid marketing to try and get paying clients? That is a tough decision. And in my own case, we decided to go. We'd be marketing all through the, the COVID uh, situation, but it was just organic marketing, staying in touch with past customers, inspiration marketing organically for new customers. We weren't spending any money because we didn't have any money to spend. But the minute I thought the business had a chance of opening in July, I started paid marketing in 10th of June to try and drive that demand into the business. Paid marketing via Google, paid marketing via Facebook. Started with Facebook first, led on to paid marketing Google, started to get the feedback. And here's another positive. My experience from that is the pent up demand from customers is huge. It's off the chart. We're not going to be able to deal with the demand that we've got coming because we're off having to operate, which I'll go into in smaller numbers. But the pent up demand for customers to get out and do something is huge. Now, obviously, you're going to have your past history and your relevant place today. Your past customers for 2019 and 2018 and 27 and maybe all your history are probably not your customers as we speak at the moment because you can't get access to them. They're not getting into the country or they're not coming into the country. So, we're in no different position. We've always had a bit of a local business, but in this time of the year, we were heavily international, not so much US clients that I know a lot of the Italian operators were, but we were heavily Dutch, heavily French, heavily German, heavily Swiss, uh, and really heavily English. And I know we're all part of the UK, but England is still 400 miles down to London from us here. Now, at the present moment, although I'm seeing demand off the charts, it's all local demand. And when I say local demand, it's from a 150-mile radius around us, which takes in a couple of big cities, Edinburgh and Glasgow. I'm seeing a little demand from England, not a lot, and I'm seeing virtually no demand from Europe. 
a little tiny 1%, 2% coming from a markets of Holland and Switzerland that we normally get clients coming over from. So what does that mean? That means we've obviously had to alter our products a little bit. And I would suggest everybody needs to understand what markets are open to you and make sure you've designed your products to fit the market that is open to you. Not the market you want to be open to you, because that's for next year, but the markets that are open to you often involve a rejig of your product and it may re involve a rejig of the pricing. Uh, and I'm a bit like Chris in a time like this, I'm not big into discounting. We have banned discounting. We will not be discounting to anybody. In fact, we're going the other way. We've been increasing prices because we're doing a lot of private trips, giving people the option to do they want a private trip or do they want to be in a small group trip. So discounting, I would suggest, is not a thing that's going to get businesses out of trouble who have actually been locked down and had no revenue for months on end. It's you want to make the maximum you can at the moment from the amount of clients you've got. Now, every food and, op food and drink operator is going to be different. You're going to have to understand what your break-even point is. And that may sound obvious, but I've spoke to over 200 operators in the last three months, and many of them could not tell me over the top of their head what their break-even point was. I know in my own businesses... I need 35% of my normal numbers to break even. That means if I open, and I have, and I don't hit 35%, my losses are going to treble this month compared with last month when I was closed. So that is a calculation every operator is going to do when you have to open. What do you need to do to justify open to make sure you don't lose more being open than you do from being closed? I know I'm going to hit the 35%. I'm hoping to maybe even get up to 50 60% because I'm judging it on a daily basis from the demand that is coming in. There is absolutely no way, no matter what the demand is, are we going to be in a position to deliver 100% of the volume we did last year. And what's the reasons for that? No matter what the demand is from a customer, when they're coming into your operation now, doesn't matter what type of operation you are for food and drink, you're going to have to change the way you operate. For us, we have vehicles involved we're taking less people per vehicle. That means more movement per vehicle, so we're doing more journeys. That elongates the day. Every time we meet a customer group, and we're dealing with small groups at the moment, four people, five people, 10 people, nothing, nothing bigger than that, there is a long, drawn-out conversation about all the procedures we have to do. There's the hand-washing we have to go through. Uh, for us, there's equipment involved, that that equipment has to be all prepared only one group at a time can get changed into that equipment, out of that equipment. So all of this thing is time. So it doesn't matter what your operation is, you're going to have elongated time in your operation, and time is money. That means your operation is going to cost more. And if you're just taking the same revenue without discounting, your operation is still costing more, so your margin is going to be less. So we've not just got less volume, we're probably going to have increased costs. I know how much money I spent last week just buying sanitary products and gels for people to wash down and stuff to do all the gear. It was hundreds and hundreds of dollars just to get gear ready on a daily basis. And that's not a one-off cost. That cost is going to go on. Therefore, my margins have been eroded. When you're operating with less numbers, if you're on a yield basis, many tourism businesses are on a yield basis. If you're operating at less numbers, your margins are going to be eroded. So one of the operational things that I think every food and tour business really needs to get into more than you've ever done before is your numbers and understanding your numbers. What's your margins? What's your break even? If you are distributing at the moment through agents, through OTAs, through partners, can you afford to? Or is the business level you're getting, can you just get direct business at the moment and ignore the distribution channels for this moment? There's Arguments for that, there's arguments against that, depending on where you are and how your business is. The minute international travel starts again, you want to be working with distribution. You want to be working with the OTAs because they have a much better reach than any food and, to, uh, food and drink operator to reach international customers. But if you're experiencing what I'm experiencing at the moment and all my customers are within 150 miles, I'm not getting any bookings from OTAs because OTAs are not good with local bookings. Local people find local things to do by searching locally. And the way Google is and the way Facebook is, you can hit direct customers locally without using distribution that's going to charge you 20 to 30%. But if you're in a destination and you've logged on to a flight radar or you've got in contact with your local airport and you know the air, airlines are coming in, 
that data that's telling you how many customers is on the mailer lines is available, you can then make judgments about how many international clients are actually alive and in my destination. And if you have a trend of upward and in, upward trend of international clients arriving in your destination, you need to switch on your OTA marketing and you need to switch on your distribution marketing because these guys will find these customers before before you use the some things on virtual tours and digital tours. Over the last three months, everybody was shocked. We've seen a big push into what can we do digitally and virtually to entertain our customers or maybe generate some revenue. And there was two, two thought periods here. A lot of people were very positive about it. Some people were negative about it. I personally, I sat in the middle. I sat in the fence on this because I just really didn't know because we had no data to back up what we were creating. So we've seen lots of new digital tours, lots of food and tour drink operators created digital tours, created wine tasting tours, created drinking tours. Within weeks, these had evolved into e-commerce businesses. So I know food tour businesses that were normally guiding clients around the city centre who are now e-commerce businesses because they're sending out drink by courier, by Amazon or whatever couriers they're used, and then two nights later, they're having an online drinking, wine tasting, drink tasting, food tasting, virtual event. Are these as profitable as your real tours? No, of course they're not. Do they have a benefit? Yes, they do. Because what are they doing? They're opening up to you a much bigger market. Digital products can reach millions of more people than your real live product can. So if you design digital products, you're not going to make that much money off the digital products it's, itself with the exception of the e-commerce because I've seen some food and to, uh, drink businesses do very well off e-commerce. The actual presentation, the actual event online probably isn't going to make you much money. People are selling them for 10 to $15 and some people are generating revenue, but the cost of setting them up is going to eat that up. But what it does do is engage with a much bigger audience and what it does do if it's done correctly is it motivates that audience to become a live customer to you at some time in the future. So one of the disruptions I'm seeing that's been speeded up here is I strongly believe every single operator has begun to become a hybrid operator. And it doesn't matter if you're in adventure like I am or if you're in drink and food, wine tours like you are. You're going to become hybrid. Your core business will always be that customer experience in the vineyard, in the wine cellar, that face-to-face, -face, that experience in the wine and the food. That will always be your core business. And that will be the smallest amount of customers. You may take 5,000 doing that. You may take 10,000 doing that. But digitally, you have an opportunity to reach 100,000, 500,000, a million. And if you do that correctly, that means your capacity of 5,000 or 10,000 in real life has got a funnel filling it at all times. And then once you achieve this, what you do in business is the price of your live product will start to increase. Digital products invariably end up being priced at zero. They depreciate over time, they always do. Music, video, Netflix, you pay $6 a month or whatever for world-class uh, product. So digital products tend to end up going to zero because they get massive distribution. But if you get massive distribution, you will entice people into your real product and you will be able to increase the margins on your, your real product. So quick summary on that. If we can survive to 2020, you're in the right sector at the right time. People are going to want to get out. They're going to get back and they have to drink and they have to eat on every day. They don't have to do the stuff I sell and the stuff we do every day, but they have to do the stuff you do. So it's a case of marketing. And if there was ever a sector that really needs world-class marketing, it's food and tours because you're marketing to an open window. The people need to eat and drink every day. There's very other in the tour sector that can say that. So you're in a good place going forward. However, for all of us in this current place, getting through this next three months, we're all spending more money. We've all got less volume. And the management of what we're doing is incredibly difficult. However, the feedback I've had this week from over 200 clients is they're all very understanding. They're all desperate to get out and do something. They all accept things have changed. They all accept there's lots of different procedures. They all accept they have to wash their hands, do this, do that, the next thing. We haven't had any negative feedback of people pushing back on all the 
negative uh, extra things that had to be done. People just seem to be really, really happy to be able to get out and experience stuff again. Unfortunately, we can't send them into the distillery at the moment because our food and wine stuff doesn't and drinks uh, tours don't start until the 15th of July when the, the distillery gets open again. Okay, thanks very much. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Okay, that's food for thought, as they say. <laughs> Now let's uh, let's have a look at the questions. Uh, I've got, I do have a question that was um, sent in earlier from uh, a lady in Armenia. It's quite a, quite a long one. I, I think Chris, if you could uh, uh, handle this one, it may, may have been um, parts of it may have been answered already. But uh, if if we could uh, read read the question, let's have a look. I need glasses. I'm Armin from Armenia. I work in the tourism industry now for 10 years as a tour guide, organizer, and now I'm a student at the Wine Academy. So in mind, I have to develop an interest for wine tourism in Armenia. Okay. Hence, my question is the following. What are the predictions about the wine tourism for the nearest future after lockdowns and generally after the COVID-19 situation? One question, uh, perhaps one for Chris. Has, have tourists' interest in tasting new cultures increased or maybe decreased? And has their taste changed about wine? I mean, new and old worlds, or maybe they look for new experiences. Maybe I can answer that last bit um, as it's more technical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, generally on the whole, I, I, I think, what you need to understand is, is, is people's pent up um, travel uh, expectations or whatever word you want to call that. It's, you know, people have been stuck at home for so long and stuck in their destinations for so long. So wherever they are, they are allowed to travel to, whether that's to a neighbouring country or further afield, if they're able to fly somewhere, they will do it just to get away, have different scenery, just to explore and experience something new. Um, I'm a big believer that no, like I say, you've seen things happening here in the UK and other destinations across the world. As soon as borders have opened up, bookings have been made, things have, things have happened. No, we did, uh, uh, we targeted for one client, um, so it's not within tourism, uh, sorry, wine tourism, but we targeted one client's demographic for doing bike tours across Israel. And we targeted Germans who have a big bike culture. Uh, and he had an abundance of leads come in from very little paying, uh, sort of a very sort of low paying Facebook advertising. So people are looking to do things. People are looking to explore something new. Um, and I don't think, uh, if anything, I don't think um, taste would have changed. Or if people are interested in wine, they will still want to do some form of wine tourism. Um, and they'll just do that in the countries they are allowed to go to, rather than maybe the places they always go to. Um, so they'll just do it somewhere differently. And it might open their eyes to new experiences. If I just uh, can comment on that one, uh, I'm a regular traveler. Normally I go to over a dozen countries a year, obviously not at the moment. And I've been to over 130 countries and most of the countries I go to are developing nations. Sometimes I have to go back to the ones I'm working, but most of them are developing nations. I was in Armenia in November there. So the trends for the last 10, 15 years have been more and more people want to go to developing new destinations. This situation is not changing that. It's put a break on it for a period of time. But if we get back to more normal situations next year, people will want to go to these new developing destinations. And you could argue, and we're starting to see some data on it, that the demand has actually increased because people don't want to go to the regular destinations where they have millions and millions of people in crowds. People, do people want to go to Paris anymore, Barcelona, where there are big crowds in or they're getting a bit more adventurous and looking at new destinations. So I don't think there's a, a worry about people going to places like Armenia in increasing numbers. I think that's a trend that's going to definitely continue. Obviously, we need to be in a situation where that is able to happen. But I'm a great believer on working with what you've got, not what you're hoping is going to happen. And if you think of it logically, the countries around Armenia, the ones that can get there in one short flight, they're more likely to go than ones that are going to take two flights or three flights and 16 hours to get there. Therefore, you just have to think it through logically, but there is certainly no threat I see to the developing nations not developing more tourism going forward. I would argue this is, 
it may not seem like it at the, t at the moment for obvious reasons, but in the future, we may look back and say this was a great boost to these developing nations. I agree. Yes. And uh, of course, Russia has uh, direct flights to Armenia, so uh, that's uh, maybe a, t a, market, a market to, um, to target. And of course, uh, Armenia's uh, fantastic wine tourism uh, uh, destination, as it's demonstrated that it has the, discovered the oldest uh, winemaking facilities, uh, 5,000 or so years. Uh, so if, if you um, uh, if you can get tours to Armenia, they're, they're going to be uh, I'm sure a great experience. Nothing like um, uh, the New World uh, experience. I have a question from uh, Adrian. How do you uh, access wine wine tourism? People shouldn't uh, drive if drinking, but um, can you get them? In minibuses, so I guess this is a question about. Um, uh, I think uh, perhaps a question for Pete to answer because you touched on um, uh, vehicle sizes uh, with, with with in your your presentation. Uh, that, I mean, the answer is uh, more more minibuses, isn't it? Yeah, the the answer is a bit more complex than that, and this is something tour operators often miss. Tour operators and tour guides on the whole are great people people. They love talking to people. They love demonstrating. They love getting people smiling. They just love that whole interaction with people. What a tour business is, is a logistics business. Logistics is the core of the business. You have to think through not just the logistics of your own things you have to do in the business. You have to think through the logistics of your customer. Now, I know many tour businesses are great with their own logistics, but they don't think through the logistics of your customer. And this is a perfect example. If someone wants to go and have a great wine tasting experience or port taste, I had a fantastic port tasting experience in, in Porto last year, you obviously can't drive after that. So as a, as a tour business, you have to anticipate that, have to come up with a product that addresses that and then market that to the customer. Because once you take that barrier away of driving, you will see an increase in bookings for that business. It's as simple as that. But driving and drink is a barrier. Therefore, as a tour operator, you come up with a way it takes it away. And obviously, that involves your own transport and buses, uh, drivers, etc. And you have to make sure that works from a margin point of view. But every time you remove a barrier to booking, your bookings increase. And I know from the stuff we do that involves alcohol after the events, driving is a barrier. Therefore, we create packages where we're responsible for moving people about and they don't need to drive. Okay. Yeah, if, I, if I can add to that, yeah. no, there's a, there's a, yeah. a, a tour company. Um, there's a tour company here. Um, uh, the name escapes me, but there's one down in the south of uh, England. Uh, it runs a, a gin distillery. Uh, obviously not wine, but it's a similar uh, sort of aspect. But what they do is they have a, a mini coach, which is obviously going to be... A, bring less people in uh, because of the, the social distancing. But that will then bring people, it drives around London, for example, it will pick people up and drive them to this distillery to uh, participate in, in the tour there and then drive them back. Uh, and they put that on themselves. So this is what no, I think what no, Peter's alluding to is, is looking at these different aspects and can you bring in transport? Can you do other things? Obviously within the COVID sphere now that you can, that will allow your customers to come back and forward without having um, uh, the worry of, of driving uh, after after a few drinks. Okay, uh, Sean is asking. Many regions have wine trails, whiskey trails, brewery trails, and so on. Is there a case to be made for uh, combined drinks trails uh, with different types of producers collaborating at a city, a region, a country, or country level? I'll take that. My experience has been every time you combine products, you get higher customer satisfaction. And that doesn't matter what products you combine. If you take a really good operator in one sector and a really good operator in another sector and come up and combine it, you the customer perceives more value before they actually book. It looks more value. And then the experience of actually doing it, in my experience, what seen many operators doing this around the world, it, it really, really does work, and I'm a massive fan of it, collaborating with you. We can't be experts in every single sector, therefore work with other sectors, collaborate. If we take that a bit further, which I really haven't seen in wine and food tourism so much, is X number of countries have great wine tourism, but I don't see any real collaboration between 
different destinations. If if it's a big operator and they have operations in Italy and Spain and France and Portugal, yes, that's going on. But I don't see wine and tour operators in Italy combining with other small operators in France and Portugal. So I do think there's room for this to be grown just in your niche uh, because you get that will be for your targeted customer who's a real obsessive with the sector and who does it all the time. Your more general customer, and I would say I'm a customer of your sector because I do buy wine and food tours when I'm traveling. So I would say I'm a general customer. And what I look for is I will do some that's just wine and I will do some that's wine and food, but I will really look for the ones that's wine, food and something else. Because my experience as a customer, I get a much better day experience if it combines the, because I'm not a wine guru who's really having to go deep. It's more the experience, the pleasantness, and if it's combined with something else that's there. So I think it's a huge opportunity for this sector. Remember, I go back to you're in a sector, people need to drink and eat every single day. <laughs> Therefore, this is a marketing message. <laughs> yeah, so paragliding in the morning and then uh, wine, wine revisit and lunch in the afternoon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, on that actually, you know what I what I've seen happening uh, is when you think about when people go back to their jobs and back to work, um, booking up a a week's holiday uh, is going to be hard now because they've been off for so long. Being able to take a holiday, going back to work straight after a, a lockdown is going to be hard. So what we're actually seeing, and um, we're advising a lot of our operators, is to look at especially those who are doing multi day trips, is to do smaller multi day trips. So things maybe over a weekend where people can then go and explore different wineries or different parts of a, of a region to then partner up and have those businesses partner up to do that side of things, but do it on a, a much smaller scale in terms of maybe only two or three days, because people's time will be limited going forward just because they're only getting back to work and being able to book a trip or a holiday is going to be a little bit harder over a longer period. So think about it as a short, short term weekend break. Okay, Sonia, next. Uh... What about asking? What about the um, the content for those virtu uh, virtual tours? And uh, Pete, uh, what is a uh, question for you first? What should the, be the content for those virtual tours? Meeting, meeting, like meeting with a winemaker, tasting the wines, visiting the cellar. Um, yeah, this, this stuff isn't this stuff isn't easy, and it requires innovative thought and. You, basically, you're telling a story digitally, be it video, we're using video. So you're telling a digital story. So it depends on what your wine and food operation is. But if it's really story-based in real time, in live time, you really want to make it real story-based digitally. If it's more about the actual tasting of the product and it's high-end product and it's more about that, you're going to have to get some of that product delivered so you can go through all these the tastings and the experience of that. So you really need to look at what your product is live before you create your your digital version of it. And this stuff's easy to say. It's not easy to do. Believe me, in the last three months, I watched so many digital tours and experiences. Some of them were fantastic and some of them were atrocious. Not everybody comes across as a, a, great, a great guide knowing their stuff face-to-face -face, may not do it and may not cut it digitally. Some companies... I think are going to end up going all in on this because they've found out they're brilliant at it and they, they'll double down on it and double down on it. So it really is your skill base, your resources. Can you do this well or is it weak? Uh, do you have the commitment to do it? Because it's not easy. But if you can do it, the benefits are huge. The reach is massive and you really bed in with a customer more. You, you're deepening the relationship with the customer. Uh, prior to probably meeting the customer in real life or certainly meeting the percentage of them. But base it around what you do in real life. If you have a guy in that winery who's the expert, who knows everything and is the guy that everybody gives reviews about in 2019, he's the guy that's got to be speaking digitally or the girl that's got to be speaking digitally. Yes. Uh, in fact, we, we did a, um, in, in, back in March, a wine tourism at home which consisted of um, uh, signing up for a wine tour and uh, tasting of three, three products. And of course we had to deliver uh, the three products uh, to the customer and book in advance with a, 
an expert guide uh, a time and day so that the, the, the program and the tasting could be done and it consisted of videos, handouts, photos uh, of the winery. And uh, th th that worked well, that worked well for, for the time that everybody was kind of locked down. So that was our example of doing um, wine tourism online, as it were. Yep. Um, Stefano is a, a question, quite a long one. Let's have a look. We opened the brand new winery in Tuscany just a few weeks ago, and the heart and soul of the winery is related to tourism. Right. We know that this year is almost over and we can't expect anything. My question is, would you suggest to send up mails, presentations, offers, and, and so to international tour operators for 2021, or do you think it's too early for operators to plan? Chris, what's your take on that one? Uh, it's never too early. I would be planning now. Um, you should have already been planning for 2021 if you haven't done it now, in my opinion. Um, but we've had some great success with a few of our customers in terms of putting out messaging to say book now. You don't have to pay anything now. Um, in some cases, they and some operators are taking money now or a deposit. But it's like book now for a tour in 2021. And they'll give them a date once they know more about dates. But it's like an open-ended ticket. So they'll maybe pay a small deposit and then be able to book an actual date next year. We also know of another operator who is um, offering a subscription model. So they will say, OK, you can book a, a trip sometime maybe next August, for example. Um, but they're allowing that uh, customer to pay every month over a longer period, which is going to make it easier for the customer, but then give that operator some cash flow as well. So I would say, yes, focus now on 2021. Uh, and, and one of the ones I mentioned earlier, was um, with that tour operator, we were focusing on uh, at bookings for 2021. Um, and he had, within the space of a month, they had 43 inquiries of people looking to do tours in that period, which was, if everyone was to book, which they obviously won't, but the value of those leads were close to $180,000 worth of uh, potential bookings. And people are looking now for things to do next year. So act on it now. I would be certainly focusing on uh, trying to get bookings in for 2021 for sure. Just just on that, if you've just invested in a new winery, you've got to get a return as quick as you can, otherwise you won't be open very long. So mm -hmm. you have to get on this ASAP. Now, the return for 2021 is going to be not, and you may get disheartened because people may not book in the numbers that you would expect in a normal year for 2021 at the moment because they're still waiting because of the situation. But that should not stop you speaking to them. That should not mm -hmm. stop you marketing them conversations are the preamble of the eventual booking. So, and these conversations in this period are going to be much longer. People are definitely more reticent to book international trips at the moment. I have an international outbound business, right? I, and that I have long trips of four weeks plus. I'm not taking bookings for next year, but I've got interest for next year because I'm generating interest and I'm changing the product to match the interest. People are more concerned, not so much about the COVID situation from a health perspective for next year, they're much more concerned about the economic situation. Will they have a job? If they pay a big deposit, are they going to get it back? Because many people have had a bad experience over this period. So it's more to do with the, the money side of it and the commitment side of it. And, you, and as an operator, you don't really want to push that. You want to stay communicating with the customer, regular, talk them through it as their confidence builds, as they think, see things changing in the world. If it's for the better, and eventually the bookings will come. Mm -hmm. Having said all of that, I'm planning, and this sounds terrible, but I'm planning on being shut down again next year because not to plan would be naive because of the situ situation we're in. So you plan to be open and have a boom time next year, but we've all got had this experience. We should all be planning what if this carries on. And for an operator who's reliant on international bookings, you have to have to come up with a local offering. It's not easy but you have to come up with a local offering because that's a resilient business. If you can get locals into your business, your business is more resilient. Okay. Uh, Marco, let's have a look. He lost his connection for a while, so he didn't know if we answered the question. I, I don't think we did. Um, immediate future in wine and food experiences will be top and expensive or basic and cheap. Well, I think uh, both of you touched on um, policies of pricing. 
you want to say on uh, reply on that one, um, Pete? Yeah, I mean, I've been about the travel industry long enough that I know as vol as volume starts to go up, we will have a, a price war. I know that hotels have already started, flights in some cases have, they've gone the other way in some cases, but you will have people that go into the discount more. I just can't see any sense of doing it when you don't have the volume to justify it. You're going to be operating with less customers no matter what happens in the next six months. We're all going to have less customers. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there can be no justification for discounting prices because you haven't made any money for months and you're going to discount and then be operating at zero margin cash flow going. So that there can be anyone who's going cheap coming out of this is just killing the business even more than it's damaged already. So we all need to look at more you have to strike the right value for the customer. The value equation of the customer is absolutely critical, but you have to look at trying, how can I make more margin with less customers? Because you're going to have less customers. Do, do we add extras in? Do we do specials? Do we go private? All of these considerations. If they're getting X, Y, Z bottle of wine, at X cost, which is worth that, do they get ABC bottle of wine that's worth a lot more? Every operator has to go through what added value can they give to the customer to make more margin from the customer because you're going to have less customers for a foreseeable period of time. And Chris, would you echo that? I, I, I agree with Peter. Um, though if you're already an operator who was one for heavily discounting and stuff like that, I think you really need to start shifting your focus to try and bring in more revenue. And the only way you're going to do that is by upping your prices. Um, you know, if you, as, as Peter says, the, the volume is going to be a lot less um, so all you're going to do is kill your business going forward. And then, as, as sort of Peter alluded to earlier, if this was to come back um, and have a third, fourth, fifth wave or whatever it would be next year, um, are you going to build up enough revenue um, and cash flow to cater for the next crisis that comes along? And there will be another crisis at some point. So um, by discounting and having less cash flow in the bank, you're only going to kill your business even further. Right. Okay. Uh, so I, I don't see any more questions. I think we've actually answered all of the questions that have come in. Uh, so Chris has kindly um, uh, given us a, a handout for you. Uh, uh, COVID battle plan, I believe is the name. Let me just, can we share that um, moderator? Yes, there we go. We're sharing that. Okay. So you're, you're uh, welcome to um, take that away. Uh, have a read through it. So, uh, a lot of food for thought and uh, uh, packed with um, ideas and information for um, for everybody in, in in the business of uh, wine, food, tourism, and and, and and indeed other kinds of tourism activities. So thank you for that, Chris. You're welcome. Okay, so um, that's it. I think I think we have no more questions. Uh, so it leads me just to say, uh, if you enjoyed what Chris and uh, Pete had to say, uh, you, you're going to see them at the uh, International Wine Tourism Conference coming up in October and through the Venezia Giulia. They'll, they'll both be with us, um, flight, uh, flights yeah. depending. We, we hope to have them there. For sure, we'll have them there. And, and so you can meet them in person and, and chat with them over a, a glass of Fiulano, which is the, um, the white delicious white um, uh, wine of the of the region. So thank you very much to uh, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you very much to Peter. Thanks for listening, everyone. And I look forward to seeing some of you in Italy in October. Uh, yeah. And thank you both for your, your wisdom on uh, wine and culinary tourism 2020 and, and beyond. Uh, just finally, I'd like to say that uh, those of you I know many of you are already registered and, and will be coming to join us in, in October. Some of you may not be. Um, there is um, a link here I'm going to put up, or at least my, my colleagues will, um, where you can uh, hit a button and you can go into the, the registration page if, if you want to uh, uh, register. Remember that uh, if you've attended both sessions uh, end to end, then uh, you'll be eligible for a free place, which we'll, we'll draw shortly after the program and uh, if you have actually registered and paid then you, you and, and you win at the place you'll get uh, refunded so that the offer is is I think people see it if you can't uh, do say so uh, 
click on there and it'll take you into the into the website so that's it uh, we hope to see you all or most of you uh, at a future edition of international wine tourism next when course is the end of october and um I hope to see you there for a, a glass or two of Friulano for the best education, for the best business opportunities and for the best networking opportunities. I, I see you've all had a, a bit of a networking session on the chat, so that's good. Uh, so, so it's working together is good and uh, I hope you um, make some uh, synergies between you all. If you need us to help make contacts between you, just send us an email and uh, we'll try and connect people somehow through the Facebook group page or, or other means that we have at our disposal. Thank you all and see you all in uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia in October, we hope. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.